Okay, cool. Um, I'll hop right in. Thank you, Aaron, if you can hear me. Thank you so much for the introduction. And if you can't, I still thank you. Um, so this is going to be a short talk. I've titled this, Can We Solve Emerging Challenges in Technology and AI by Giving Communities Data Leverage? And this is kind of a big mashup of lots of the research in my dissertation. And it's actually, it's very funny. I'm at Northwestern right now, um, not through any affiliation of my grad school, really, but actually through another colleague. I was giving a talk to the AI safety community there uh, that was very similar to this. And so hopefully I will, uh, you know, be able to, to, to show you how, how those things maybe are connected and maybe I convince some of them as well. Um, so with that being said, I will just hop right in. Um, cool. So a little bit of the background, some motivation for the work. Um, since I started grad school, I was very excited about the potential of AI, uh, but concerned about potential negative impacts, especially likelihood for major inequalities in power and wealth. Um, kind of driven by new capabilities that we didn't anticipate, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago, et cetera. Uh, at the same time, I was very interested in the underappreciated value of data. Um, for instance, at the time I was starting grad school, there was this growing evidence that Wikipedia is, is much more critical as a dependency for modern AI and computing than we had previously realized. Uh, and when discussing search and recommendation, people often undervalued the role of trace data, basically the users, and would focus more on the role of the computer scientists. So this untapped value has a... Uh, potential upside, uh, it's a source of collective power, maybe. So a key hypothesis for me is that by building better designed AI systems, people can use the collective power that emerges from their uh, data contributor role to work towards this more mutually beneficial relationship where data creators enjoy prosperity alongside AI operators. And I'm going to give away the game a little bit. Um, the One of the big themes in the work is that this needs to be done at the group level. So there needs none of this is going to work without um, communities and without basically community governance and so that's where hopefully you will see uh, the connection. Some of these papers might sound more like economics papers or, or machine learning papers, um, but hopefully it will, it will all come together at the end uh, or at the beginning, I guess, because I already gave it away. Um, so right now, everyone is making these economic trade-offs when it comes to data, but doing so in the context of massive information asymmetry. Members of the public are not privy to information about the value of their individual uh, contributions, let alone the combinatorial value. Uh, and this applies to many kinds of tech, but especially... Um, these kind of like foundation models, chat GPTs that have been in the news a lot lately. And that um, I, I guess I've been kind of leaning more towards because there's so much public interest in them. Uh, so methodologically, and then kind of like, what work am I going to talk about? It's a mix of observational analysis of online platforms, uh, algorithm auditing, machine learning experiments, um, doing content analysis, building tools, which is something that I'm uh, going to do right now. And oh, also, I guess I didn't spoil this already. The, the, the project that I'm working on right now is with Amy. So it, this is a very much a, a connected presentation and the, uh, the topics are, uh, you know, really segue together here. And the kind of places where you might see my work, if you're curious about that, is the web conference, ICWSM, the a FACT, which is Fairness, Accountability, and Transparency, uh, and like CHI and CSCW. And the kind of data sets that I've worked with include like Wikipedia, um, search engine scraping, Reddit, Stack Exchange, MovieLens. Um, all of which are, in, in some shape or form, online communities, uh, I guess, except search engines. Um, okay, so the goals of my research, I guess, I could kind of put it into two categories, measuring the value of existing data sources and um, supporting collective action around data value. And uh, that's where the community governance aspect is going to come in. So uh, what's the connection to this foundation model stuff? Well, we've seen kind of an explosion of public interest in AI because of the, the chat GPTs and the, the GPT line more broadly. Um, and I'm very excited. I think that data leverage, especially kind of actioned by online communities, such as a group of folks who all contribute to the same GitHub project, um, can kind of use this as a way to attack information asymmetry, scaffold collective action. Um, certainly, some firms and platforms will benefit more than others from the kind of things that I'm going to describe. Uh, but kind of the long term vision is to have a reshaped set of power dynamics around AI, where the public um, operating through kind of coalitions and communities and groups is is in some sense negotiating with technology companies or kind of providing a feedback mechanism that's outside of state intervention or worker-led action, uh, but totally complementary to both. Um, so the discussion, when I started the work, this was super uh, wacky and, you know, reviewers and colleagues were not excited about it and thought that it was implausible. Um, but I've been really lucky that more, more recently, there's actually quite a bit of media attention in the area, um, including this is news coverage recently of our own work. Um, if you're curious more about this afterwards, the MIT Tech Review article is really nice. And actually, I will um, show for myself at the end. I just, just this morning, uh, myself and my really close partner in crime colleague, Han Lin uh, Lee, who is a postdoc at Berkeley and is going to be a professor at the University of Texas, Austin uh, next year, we wrote an op-ed in Wired uh, on this topic. So I will share a link to that and you, you can check it out um, and you might find that cool. <clears throat> so 
Before I jump into any specific studies, let me just introduce this kind of formative data as labor concept, which is maybe you know a little controversial and maybe that will spark some discussion, but it also it drives a lot of my research. So I think it's important to uh, put it in the front. So it's uncontroversial to note that most members of the public have this direct role in generating company revenue through their role as consumers. Uh, so in the case of tech, this means buying products, viewing ads, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and many companies use some kind of intelligent technology, which could be a regression model that tells me whether I should buy, you know, produce more red shoes or blue shoes. Um, or, I mean, just like a mean estimation, really, or a regression model. Um, but it could also be these crazy deep neural networks doing classification or language models that are pumping out poems and essays and code, yada, yada. Um, almost all these intelligent technologies rely on activities from the, the public, that same public that is consuming products and ads. So the public is providing this kind of unseen data labor subsidy. It's an underappreciated role. Um, and this is very exciting because it's a potential source of leverage. Um, so we're all, in a certain sense, moonlighting for, for tech companies, uh, whether we, we want to or not. It's really hard to avoid doing so. Um, okay, so this data is labor concept. It kind of draws on some of these older books, Who Owns the Future and Radical Markets. Um, there's kind of a cool community around this now, which the Radical Exchange community um, was very influential in kind of my, my work. And uh, just last Last week, there's a newer kind of, I guess, broader community uh, around this concept of plurality um, that I'd be happy to talk a little bit about at the end. It's very new and, and nascent, and no one really knows exactly what the boundaries of it are, but it, it's a, it's very relevant. Um, okay, an example of this, this data labor frame, what does it mean to use the data labor frame to look at an AI system? Let's just consider a search engine. So we could say, okay, a search engine, what does it, how, what does it rely on? You know, there's computers, there's servers at the Google headquarters, there's software engineers, but also you need to have explicit data labor, which actually are, are active, ex like explicit in the um, like the recommender system sense of people are explicitly choosing to take action versus implicitly being surveilled while they do stuff. Uh, Wikipedia, Stack Exchange, you have to someone has to sit down and actually write the content, um, and also open source code would fall under this category. But then there's also implicit data labor, which is the clicks, the dwell time, the browsing patterns, patterns, all the things that actually make it possible to rank um, this uh, rank your search results. So ChatGPT draws on efforts required to write text of so people who write books, code, tweets, blogs, news. Um, all of that is kind of going into the ChatGPT funnel. Um, it also draws on accidental filtering efforts. So if you upvote things on Reddit, that is actually a really key step in how OpenAI filters their training data. So that doesn't seem quite as obvious as, okay, yeah, if I'm writing code, obviously Microsoft might surveil me and use that to make their code language model better. But also if I upload on Reddit, that, that's helping to kind of govern what goes into training data sets. Um, if you just participate in like the governance of, of Wikipedia or kind of select, you know, what articles can be included or what, how new articles should be, um, you know, added, that will control what these models can, can answer questions. Um, and for instance, the governance practices on GitHub would have a really big effect on what languages ChatGPT can answer, uh, can do like coding tasks well. And there's also very intentional filtering. There's a lot of paid human feedback, um, some of which was just in the news because it was actually like heavily outsourced and there was a lot of controversy over the very low wages that the, um, that the workers were paid. Um, so I've also, I've been blogging about this a little bit lately. Um, you can, I can post that link after as well, if you're curious. Um, so I'm going to just talk a little bit about the research that we've actually done, the research papers. So first, I'm going to blast through some work on measuring the value of data. And so there was, as I mentioned, when I started my PhD, there was kind of this growing body of work where people were looking at Wikipedia and saying like, hey, it seems like Wikipedia affects things like local tourism. And Wikipedia, um, you know, is generating all this economic value because of the images in the Wikimedia Commons and yada, yada, yada. So we kind of added on to that literature and we looked specifically at Wikipedia links boosting engagement on Reddit and Stack Exchange. And our estimate there, um, we, we basically estimate that there's somewhere around $100,000 of ad revenue per year can be attributed to people posting Wikipedia links on these platforms. Um, and, and now, of course, this has kind of come back into vogue because Wikipedia and other UGC, like Stack Exchange, like, like GitHub, is fueling uh, the language models. Um, okay, we've also done a lot of work scraping search results. So we just collect a bunch of search results and kind of look at, in these SERPs, search engine results pages, how much of it is filled by user-generated content. And the answer is, is lots of it, as you might expect, but especially Wikipedia. Um, for a long time, Google is answering tons of questions by basically just giving you the relevant Wikipedia article, if it exists, which um, for English language queries, it very often does. Um, so looking at search engines, mobile devices, um, and this concept called spatial incidence rates, um, we, we conducted a study to look very specifically at, at where Wikipedia is showing up. And I'll just, I'm going to, again, blast through this for the sake of time, but we can come back to it if, if people are curious about that at the end. Um, so we have here is this is showing uh, for a big set of common queries, so queries that have a lot of volume, um, trending queries and medical queries. Uh, 
how often does Wikipedia show up? And it's, it's very, very high. So I think I have, yes, it's in the 67 to 84% um, incidence rate uh, area, not just for Google, not just on desktop. I mean, in this study, we also simulated mobile devices to see, okay, maybe it's different. You know, maybe desktop users are seeing Wikipedia much more than Google, uh, sorry, more than mobile, which is true. But on the whole, this user-generated content is really, you know, it seems to be fueling a lot of the success of search engines. It's making search engines look really good. Um, even though, you know, it's it's kind of this this volunteer work created by people who just want to to share knowledge broadly, but the, the credit is going to, to Google in many cases, not to Wikipedia. Um, and this is an issue because of this concept of the paradox of reuse, which was introduced in 2015, uh, or I mean, I'm sure it was talked about before then, but in a, uh, at the ICWSM conference, uh, it was introduced, and I have a, <laughs> this is another blog post I can, I can share for more context if that's interesting. Um, basically, the concern is that if things like uh, ChatGPT or even just search engines cause people to just get their answers from the platform and never go to Wikipedia, never go to Stack Exchange, never go to GitHub, um, then that, that kind of well is going to dry up. Um, and, and this is actually, like I, in my opinion, a very existential concern um, for these systems. I'm, I'm worried that the tech companies are not taking it too seriously right now. And this is a place where I think that um, kind of communities might be able to organize to, to fix this a little bit. Um, so what do we mean by data leverage collective action? Let me talk about that a little bit. So in this uh, fact paper, we set out to categorize and evaluate different ways that members of the public can exert leverage through their data contributing behavior. And so we're kind of drawing on a lot of different fields so data scaling, learning curves, data poisoning, um, this idea of use and non-use in HCI, and then data portability, which is kind of a, a policy discussion right now. And here's the key idea. Um, because the data dependent technologies rely on this public, um, in the sense that the public has a degree of agency to create counterfactually different technology outcomes. And that's, that's really important that this is, this is really about the public has their hand on the lever and can actually change the capabilities of these technologies. So that's a potential source of leverage because it could hurt the profits. And that is kind of, you know, the main incentive system that a lot of these organizations are, um, you know, going to listen to. So with a long enough lever, you and your broader network might be able to move large firms. Um, so to give it a formal definition, we could say it's the power to influence a company held by those who implicitly or explicitly, um, again, passively or actively, uh, contribute data on which that company relies. And at a high level, we can kind of think of that um, in terms of two buckets. So there's either collective action aimed at bringing down a data-dependent system, so making a chat GPT worse, making a recommender system worse by withholding, deleting, or so-called poisoning data contributions. Or you could imagine people coming together to boost up a target's competitor. Um, so in the, the kind of the current discourse right now, we could think of trying to make the open source coding language, maybe if you are you spend a lot of time, you know, working with OSS and you really like language models for code, you think they're good, um, but you're worried that Google or, or OpenAI is going to have a competitive advantage. So you want to make sure that there's really good data for the open source alter alternatives. You can imagine both of these things and, and the community could, could disagree on which of these is the best to do. Um, I really like data leverage because I think whether or not you, you don't really, whether you like that idea that the data generating activities should be called labor or not, and whether or not you kind of agree with this arguments about who deserves credit, um, we can just, we can always, we can ask these very falsifiable, measurable, quantifiable questions about who, what groups of people have the agency to impact the capabilities of downstream technologies. I think this provides a very, uh, it's a very nice way to not talk past each of these topics. Um, so in the paper, we make this kind of metaphor that it's a, it's a tool, it's a tool belt for the public. They are tools that can be strengthened. Um, and we go into more details about kind of the, this, this framework of lowering performance versus boosting performance. So that's again, data strikes and poisoning. And then over here, we have conscious data contribution. That's a, we introduced this term before the CDC was in the news a lot. Um, it's not the best uh, acronym that I ever picked for my, my papers, um, but that is what it is in the paper. Um, and we talk a little bit more about the details. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to go fast here so that we can focus more on, you know, discussing the parts that are interesting to folks. But basically we talk about a variety of ways that communities could engage in data strikes, um, data poisoning, uh, which is basically making or making data observations that are bad or cause the model to fail in some way. Um, and conscious data contribution, which is giving data to a competitor. Um, so kind of the data version of conscious consumerism, which I know is also a fraught idea. Some you know, people disagree on whether or not conscious consumerism is, is actually effective or even maybe distracting people from doing other kinds of activism that would be more effective. Um, but in the data case, I'm, I'm hopeful that this can be quite helpful. In the paper, we talk about the barrier to entry, basically poisoning, very hard. Uh, data strikes are, um, it can be challenging to stop using tech, but if there is adequate regulation and tools, uh, it could be quite easy. And then data contribution is actually probably the lowest barrier because data has this nice property that we can we can copy it and, and, and share it. 
quite easily. It's quite cheap, cheap to do so. And so the main concern there is figuring out which pieces, which units of, of our like data records we're actually comfortable sharing. Um, we talk about the legal and ethical considerations, poisoning, uh, serious challenges, very morally fraught, potentially illegal. Um, so careful consideration is needed. Um, data contribution probably has the most moderate amount of concern. Strikes are the least. Um, so we have a few papers too that again, uh, like the previous ones, I'm just going to, to blast through for right now. But basically we spent some time doing machine learning simulation experiments to explore, you know, when will data strikes actually be effective? Because there's a big question like, okay, are you just going to try to, you know, rile people up and then they're going to engage in collective action that does nothing? Um, so how the simulations work, we might take a typical recommender systems experiment, but imagine 30% of people delete their data um, or all the film noir fans delete their data. And there's a lot of challenges that arise that are kind of interesting. We could, if, if folks are interested in the technical side of the, the machine learning experiments, happy to talk about that uh, an hour after. And actually to, to kind of like cut to the chase, that 30% number we found is actually a very nice benchmark because that's where about half of the intelligence of personalization is lost. Or put another way, we get halfway towards an unpersonalized baseline. Um, so 30% could be a lot in the case of a Google or a Facebook, but in terms of say 30% of people who buy you know, luxury specialized coffee products on Amazon, that's actually, that's not so, that's not so insane. Um, that's not so out of the question. Uh, in the case of 30% of people who contribute, you know, code to a, to a language that's not so popular to a project that's not so popular, um, that's, that's not so out of the question either. So we have some other or work where we simulate data leverage more broadly. We looked at a bunch of other systems. So movie recommenders, item recommenders, image classification, toxic comments, um, and in this study, we get more into kind of specking out this, this simulated world where there's a large co who's the target of protest. There's a small co who is a competitor um, and small co is kind of starting with no data uh, and large co is gaining data. And I'm just going to, I'm going to, um, again, leave the, the details of here for later if, if it's of interest. But uh, here's one single slide that kind of summarizes the, the key points from this paper, which is that if we imagine a learning curve, so here's machine learning test accuracy on the y-axis and a fraction of data available on the x so we can imagine a data strike as kind of dragging the curve to the left. And in this case, it actually has a very minimal effect on the large company's image classifier because of the shape of these curves. But if that 20% of users were to give data to the small co, they could actually really boost the classification accuracy up because we have this diminishing returns curve where there's a big vertical section, but then a long horizontal section. Um, so in some cases where data strikes don't work, data contribution could be effective. Um, we talk a little bit about data leverage power, which is just a, a metric that um, kind of normalizes uh, over other machine learning performance metrics. And I'm going to skip past this for now in the interest of time. Um, and I kind of want to just skip all the way ahead to the discussion section. So one approach that emerges from the work is, is data dividends. Uh, so maybe if I started with this concern about economic inequality um, and, and also sustainability of online platforms, so maybe we should just pay people for data, pay individuals to help solve the economic inequality issues, or pay, you know, give fund communities um, that are that are supporting these things. It turns out there's a lot of questions to answer. It's very tough. Um, you know, who is going to fund it? Who is implementing it? What what machine learning tasks are we going to consider? Um, that being said, it is a real thing right now. So we have uh, myself and my my collaborators have kind of done some some serious uh, proposal work to try to say how this could work right now in California. Um, one of the interesting te techn technical aspects that comes up is this data valuation question, trying to predict what will be the impact of removing um, you know, a training data observation from uh, some training set. There's a bunch of work in this space. Um, it turns out that, uh, again, blasting through the results, just in case they're of interest and you want to talk about them later, if we do a bunch of experiments and kind of get these distributions of data values um, by different valuation cardinalities, which just means, do we look at a lot of data points at once or do we look at a few data points at once? Um, these design choices can really affect the progressivity of whether or not the payments are, are progressive, um, which is kind of a, a big concern because there's no single definition of merit for data. There's a lot of reasonable choices. Um, concretely, the value uh, to some language model of your social media posts might be very different when it's added to a corpus composed of all the people in this call versus all the people in this world. Um, and so that leads to a collective interpretation of data dividends, perhaps. Perhaps we can fund communities. So maybe GitHub Copilot and ChatGPT should send money to um, to GitHub communities to help them, you know, have conferences or uh, you know do do other things that they might they might want. And of course, how, how would they go about deciding how to use that money? Perhaps they could use some community governance tools. Um, so maybe the <laughs> the connections are starting to to form now. Or maybe ChatGPT should send money to um, support initiatives in uh, in subreddits that are like particularly prolific in producing content. Um, so these like, you know, there's a lot of subreddits that are basically half creative fiction or like people write a lot of, of high quality prose. Um, you can imagine a connection there. 
maybe we should just fund broader social programs. So rural broadband, baby bends, that's the thing that we suggested to California. Um, you might also be wondering, is this just politics disguised as AI and machine learning research? Um, uh, you can you can make the argument, but I, I do think that it's actually not. The empirical details matter here. The recommendations that we're making really arise from the actual way that data values are distributed. So a few next steps. Um, we want to basically uh, advance data dividends in California and elsewhere, um, but a broad conception of data dividends. Uh, use leverage for AI values alignment, and then also work towards um, data leverage communication tools, which need to be at the community level the community needs to deliberate, make proposals, maybe vote, but maybe not in a word governance. And it's a high stakes battleground because right now there's this, this uh, kind of interest in communities that produce code and downstream language models. And I think I'm going to cut it off right there to go to the discussion, if, if that sounds good to everyone.